So, in case you were just a smidgen late, we're going to have three sermons today. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. To set the stage, we're going to have uh, Pastor Mallory's going to share, and then Pastor Drew's going to share, and then I'm going to share. And I'm going to pray for our kids, and we're going to believe for God to set them afire in such a way that it changes our church, and it changes our city and our nation. The revival comes out of young people who are not afraid to dance in church. Amen. Amen. You know, you old people. <laughs> Isn't it funny? You can, I know, me too. Okay, fine. You're like, I, I, if I can't do that, because I will look goofy. You know, yeah, and you're all saying, you already look goofy, so go ahead. Go for God. Somebody says, were you dancing? I said, oh, you can't really call that dancing. So, uh, Right now, I'm just going to get out of the way and allow Pastor Mallory to come and share her heart, and we are so thrilled to have her be a part of our life. Anybody hear me up in here? Oh, yeah. Morning. How are you guys doing today? Yeah. Raise your hand if you are a G-Tech kid here. Let me see your hand if you are a kid and you come to church here. All right, I see a couple hands. You guys are hiding everywhere. That's awesome. All right, so how has you guys' this week been? Has it been good? I ask the kids every week, oh, what did you guys do this week? But obviously, we're not going to have time to do that today. But I've had a very interesting week. If anybody has known what I've been doing, it's been pretty crazy. So I've fulfilled, finally, finally fulfilled, after five years of having this dream, I finally am following it. And I don't know if many of you guys know, but I'm finally taking a motorcycle class. <laughs> yep, it's true. My dream is to ride a motorcycle. I mean, I've ridden some, like it's been fun, but it's like the thrill of just getting behind it. Well, I don't really know how yet, but I'm going to. And it's, it's been great, and it's been very interesting. Everyone's like, oh yeah, it's so much fun. Like it's, it's so easy, and I'm like, no. No, it's not. Like, it's been, raise your hand if you have a motorcycle you've ever driven one. Has anybody ever been on one? It's pretty scary. You have to look everywhere and you have to make sure that you know where you're going. And you may, you need to make sure. They, they say, like, prepare for the crash. And I'm like, no. No, thank you. Lord's going to protect you today. But it's been pretty crazy having that class. And I'll tell you guys a little bit about my class. So... I went on Tuesday. If you guys don't remember, on Tuesday, it was pouring down rain. Uh -huh. So it was pretty great. First day of class, you know, I come in, my little notebook, and, you know, all my gear to ride. I'm like, oh, we're just going to have class probably because it's raining. Like, who rides on the rain? We did for three hours. <laughs> we did. And it was, it was so cold. And it was humid, so it was, like, hot, but you're wearing all this stuff. And it was just, like, you're just wet. And you're just like, oh, this is disgusting. And it's, it felt just really weird. So we were walking outside. And we see our Suzuki 250s, and if you guys don't know, that's like a smaller bike. And I was pretty excited. I'm like, hey, this is, it's getting real. Like, I've already paid the money, but it's getting real right now. Like, I'm actually going to get on the bike. And so they tell us, like, oh, here's a throttle, here's a clutch. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, let's just get on the bike. And so I, I finally go to sit on the bike, and my feet can barely touch the ground. So I'm like, I'm, my tippy toes are just barely, and I'm wearing boots. Like, I'm wearing, like, the stuff I'm supposed to be wearing, and I'm still, I can barely touch the ground. So if you can imagine, everybody else is, like, sitting there, like, all ready to go. I'm, like, trying not to tip over the bike because I, I can barely touch the ground. So I was thinking, okay, it'll be fine because, you know, when you, when you drive, you're not going to be touching the ground much. So I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. Like, we're going to be driving around. I'll be fine. But then they were like, okay, well, we're going to go down, um, where you like had a big parking lot, a bunch of parking lot lines to see where we were going and everything. And it's still pouring down rain at this point. And so we're driving down and just using our clutch. And I was fine. But then they told us that we had to turn, but we couldn't use like any gas. So we had to turn like using our legs. And my legs could barely touch the ground. So I'm like trying to turn 
And it's funny because like we're all in a line, there's like nine other students, and they're all taller than me. So they were fine. But like I was trying to turn and you can't go, like you can't go to the next step until everybody's finished. Like, so like we all go together. It's like a group thing. So it's pretty nice for me. But I'm like struggling to get around this corner with my tippy toes. And after like five times of doing that, I was so tired and my legs were hurting really bad. And I accidentally stepped on one of those parking lot lines. And man, I went down hard. <laughs> I hit the ground so fast, I could barely even think about what I was doing. And you know, everybody else is on their bikes, so they're just like this. And I was like, oh, come on. Like, I'm just standing there. But then the instructor, like, he comes up to me, and he's standing right in front of me, and he's like, this is a great learning point. So when you're riding in the rain, it is very slippery. And I'm sitting there, like, the bike's on top of me. And I'm like, okay, like, are you going to help me? Are you just going to teach around me, like, doing it? I, I this bike is heavy. So when, when, I was, when I fell, there was no, like, pushing it back up. So I, I kind of, after I got out of it, I was like, you better get that up because it's not going to get up by me. I tell people, all I do is lift kids. That's all I do. I don't work out or anything. I, should, I probably should after this class because I have a huge bruise all down my leg. But it's okay. So definitely it wasn't easy my first day. It was pretty hard. Actually, it came back the next, I think I have Tuesday class and I have Thursday class. So it came back a couple days later, feeling a little bit better, but still hurt kind of. And I was like, man, I was talking to the teacher. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I just feel like I'm not doing this right. I'm just embarrassed. Like, I dropped the school bike. Like, how horrible is that? <laughs> Do I have to pay for that? I don't even know. They probably going to take it out of my car. I don't know. But they probably have all my information. <laughs> but I was so nervous and I was so scared that was gonna that was going to happen again. And they actually showed me um, in the back of the garage that they have, they showed me that there was a small bike. It was a Honda Rebel, and I was like, okay, well, this is, it looks different. They said it's harder, and they said that it'd be a little more difficult for me because I've been practicing on the other bike. So they were like, well, it's just going to be really different. And I was like, well, can it, I'm going to be the only one? Like, is there going to be anybody else? Like, can other people switch if they want to? Like, yeah, but nobody else is as short as you. So I was like, fine. So I had to make a choice and they let me test drive and everything. And it like sat differently and your feet like sit like this and then the handlebars are up higher. They were like, it's just gonna be a little harder. And you might be able, you might have to switch back because it's just gonna be more difficult. And I was like, why would I want to be more difficult? Like I, I'm the type of person, I like to blend in. I like to just go with the crowd. Just don't, I don't want to be noticed. But then, you know, when I fell, everybody was like, oh yeah, we know her. She's been <laughs> fell on the first day. And so I just, at the back of my mind, the teacher, I just had that image in my mind. He was like, yep, this bike is the easiest. It's going to be the best for everybody in this class because they're new. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't know what I should do. And I, I mean, it made me think about all the times where I'm like, do I want to follow what other people are doing or should I just do what God wants me to do. And I was thinking about the scripture in the Bible about the narrow and wide gate. And it says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. That's found in Matthew 7, 13 through 14. And I was thinking about it and I was like, man, many people go and do what's easiest. They go and they do because that's, that's what we're supposed to do. It's a wide gate. We want to just go because it's the, it's the fastest way, it's the easiest way. And even when we're at school, we're just, man, just do what everybody else does, just blend in. And I was just so convicted about that. And I was like, man, I should do what's best for me. Following Jesus is what's best for me. And I was even thinking about when the disciples, um, when Jesus called his first disciples, and he was like, come and follow me. But then they, did they like just go off and they're like, oh no, Jesus, we're, we're good. No, they were like, no, they dropped their nets right away. And they stopped what they were doing and followed Jesus. They, they didn't even get like anything about what they were doing. They, I mean, Jesus, Jesus didn't say like, all right, we're gonna go eat lunch at the, at the river and then we're gonna go preach to this one guy and then we're gonna go save this guy. And no, it wasn't even like that. It was all he did was say, come and follow me. And they came and they had faith to come. It's insane. And, it, and I think like if I just had a little glimpse of their faith, 
Because I would want to know what's going on. I would want to know what we're doing. But it all takes faith, right? So many people just go in the crowd. They just want to do what everyone else is doing. And they want to be blended. But God doesn't call us to be blending in, right? He doesn't call us to be normal, right? He wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow Jesus. That's why we made the sign. We, we're having um, Wednesday, past couple Wednesday nights. These are all the kids. If you raise your hand if you helped out with this. There were so many people on Wednesday nights. Yes, yes, yep. And even we had little Clara, I think she's four, and she was just so excited about it. So we've been talking about shining our light through Jesus this past couple Wednesday nights and being the light in the darkness. And it's really important because going back to school is going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. Like, I, I, I wish I could say, yeah, it's a walk in the park, especially for Christians. It's, it's not easy. So I want to challenge you guys and say, like, who are you going to follow? Who are you going to follow in school? Is it going to lead you to good things? Or is it going to lead you to bad things? Is it going to lead you to things that you weren't even expecting? So I want you guys to know that I want you guys to follow Jesus. Each one of these footprints represent a kid in this church. And I want them, I'll be praying for them, and I'll be uh, just looking out for them, because I want them to know that every step that they take in school, there will be impact. And I'm praying that, um, that they continue to walk with Jesus, and they they're not afraid, they're not um, nervous at all, but they can proudly walk with him and shine his light in the darkness wherever we're at. So, um, yeah. So, if you guys help me with this, thank you so much, and I am praying for each one of you guys. I'll put this in the church afterwards, and we're praying every single week for you guys to go back to school. So, we're so excited, but we're also pretty pretty nervous to see all the people. We've been talking about it, and we've been pretty nervous, but it's been going well, and we're so excited for you guys, and everything that you're going to do for God. So, <laughs> so she so she told me that uh, her last sentence and I don't even think she used it so I'm sitting there going when am I supposed to go up but uh, I don't have a story like that on motorcycles I did, I did ask the other day if I should uh, maybe go skydiving <laughs> but I'm not getting into that today because I'm not. I'm scared. Right? But uh, so when I was when I think about following Jesus, I think of a couple things. Uh, wasn't in my notes, but last night I babysit. Yeah, don't ever trust me, kids. Okay. <laughs> so, but for the record, my girlfriend and I we babysit three kids, ages five, three, and one and a half. And I was like, dude, this. The three-year-old's going to be the craziest, and she's awesome, and I said, she's just going to challenge me, and I'm going to have to follow her. And my girlfriend, Megan, looks over and goes, it's going to be River, the oldest. And I go, you're, no, no, he's older, he's smarter, you know, mature. And, uh, no, mature? I had to make a deal for the five-year-old to get him to go outside and play on the swing. I had to make a deal to put his socks on. I had to make a deal to put his shoes on. And we go back in, I said, you can watch this movie. So we watch this movie, and he goes, I'll go back outside and go, I'm good about going back outside. But you know what I've learned about following Jesus? It's like following kids around. You have to be ready to move. You have to be ready to go. <laughs> and uh, as I think of following Jesus, I want to read out of Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 through 22. And here's what the Lord, where the Lord says. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Verse 20. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Verse 22, but Jesus told him, follow me and let the, bury, let the dead bury their own dead. See, when I read this, I think of the cost of following Jesus. The first one says, I'll go wherever you want. But his motives were not pure. His motives was that he wanted to be known in the land. He wanted to be known. And following Jesus is not about being known by your, by your name, but being known by his name. Yes. And when you're known by his name, it's not about recognition. It's not about glory. It's not about credit. It's about God. So we're going to look at a little bit, a few minutes for discipleship. See, what I love about this scripture where Jesus says, foxes and birds, because they have no place. There's no permanent home they have. And that's what being a disciple of Jesus is. Going where he wants us to go. And following him where he leads us. And we can only do that by being discipled. 
and learning and growing. So the second, so you know what I've learned about this scripture? It's this. Why should we expect following Jesus to be easy? Because following Jesus is a sacrifice and a service. And everything we do should center around that for our lives. You know, in this word, in verse 19, where it talks about teacher, the word teacher in there, where this scribe said teacher. There's five different instances in, the, in Matthew, in a few, a few different verses, where it talks about people coming up to Jesus and say teacher. Basically, what they're saying is, I want to follow you because you are known. I want to follow you because you're the greatest. I want to follow you because I want that prestige. But what it really means is that they had no clue who Jesus was. He wasn't about fame. He wasn't about recognition. He was about healing the sick, doing miracles, and touching lives. And that's how we should be about following Jesus. You know, I love this. This is why I really picked this first at the end. Verse 21 and verse 22. A second man arrived. And he goes, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father. In the context of this, it's not bury your father. His father was still alive. Basically, he was saying, I want to stay until my father dies so I can inherit all his estate. And then I will follow you, Jesus. Following Jesus is never on our terms. It's always on his. And when we follow him, it's like, it's what makes me think of this guy. He goes, his request, this is what it demonstrates. He felt discipleship was something that he could pick up and lay down whenever he wanted. But it wasn't picking up and laying down. It's being a disciple means 24-7. Be ready to do what God calls you to do. And listen. So, Christ wasn't heartless. He wasn't me. Because the father wasn't dead. What he's saying is, what is your first priority? What are you prioritizing? What's your obligation? The one man in the scripture was over eager, and the other man was under eager. Under eager. But neither of them knew what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. So I want to look at this for a minute. What have you counted the cost of following Jesus? Teenagers. We came back from camp about a month and a half ago, right? Six weeks. Don't do math, Ezra. That's really hard on you. Um, I just noticed his head and his eyes going backwards. But following Jesus takes a cost. What it means is being devoted and dedicated. See, I believe this year, through what happened with the boys and the girls at camp, God's going to change a whole school. God's going to stir up the well of waters and watch what God will do. And he can only do that when their hearts are willing, devoted, and dedicated. Following Jesus means setting aside and jumping in to what he has for you. See, I look at being a Christ follower as my life is evident by how I act, by how I behave, by how I talk, by how I make relationships. See, when you put other things in front of God, that is not a good equation to having Christ in your life and listening and following him. Now y'all wondering what this kitty pool is. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I blew, I, uh, Zach and I were in my office Thursday, I was trying to blow it up with my mouth, about, about 20 minutes of seeing nothing happen, I go, I'm going to do smarter, so I took a little air pump, I'm air pumping this thing, another 45 minutes go by and I'm going, I'm done, so I took it home and I aired it up the right way, but see, following Jesus means you have to jump in and go where he wants you to go, this kiddie pool, first time I was in a kiddie pool, I was about two, two or three, and I was afraid. I was afraid. It looked huge at my age. I was way down here. Woo! But my mom grabbed my hand and put me in there. And then the next day, I'm like, I don't need mom. I'm going. I'm jumping in. I'm going to do this. See, that is how our walk with Christ is. We have to jump in and not be afraid of the kiddie pool. We have to go after God and say, God, no matter what it costs, I'm going to jump in, jump in, Oh. Whoa. 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 That's why we don't, that's why preachers are not athletic, okay? Woo! I was scared. I didn't practice that, so. But you know what I think of? When we go after God, we've got to be afraid and start going after Him with abandonment. We gotta start worrying about what other people think. We are salt and life of the earth. Yes. You wanna change the school of Carlisle, the Des Moines schools. Yes. Norwalk. Yes. It's getting out of the kiddie pool and jumping oh, in, not jump. being afraid. To watch what God will do. Amen. Don't worry, I'm not jumping. <laughs> <laughs> All your minds have that on. 
Being a disciple, this costs you something. It costs you. But that cost outweighs any other cost that the world can give you. Right. You've got to be willing to jump in and listen and go after God. So, for you parents, I have, I have a challenge for you. For you teenagers, I have a challenge for you. And it's this. Are you going to leave your mark on, your, on the school this year? Are you going to leave your mark? For you parents, are you going to pray for your kids to leave a mark? So that their life can be changed, their friends' life can be changed. Where I'm expecting, this is my hope, this is my prayer, and this is what I'm praying. That God will stir up a school like a deep, deep well. And his presence will just continue to flow. And there will be kids coming by numbers to get saved, to get filled, to get yeah. delivered, free. Because God has a plan. I am so sick and tired of hearing people say, this generation can't do anything. I believe this is the greatest generation. I believe this generation is going to change the world. And I believe the church is going to be better for it. But as you parents, I'm challenging you to never give up to pray for your kids. Because they go into a war zone. I, I serve at Lincoln every, when the when basketball season, I go every other day. And I hear what kids say. And I see what kids do. And I'm telling you, we need prayer. So the strong, the mighty, will continue to jump in. And I want to challenge you. Jump in. Don't be afraid, kids, students. Jump in the pool and say, God, I'll go where you go. I'll do what you do. Because it's all about that. <laughs> Leave your mark. Now I'm going to turn it over to our closer, the man of the hour, who's got God's word. <laughs>
Because you're so important. As Pastor Drew said, our kids are going out into a battlefield. They're going out into a battlefield where there is uh, not just peer pressure, because there is. There's, wherever you go, whatever you do, there's peer pressure. Everybody says, ride this motorcycle. <laughs> Real men ride Harleys. <laughs> That's Pastor Mallory's like, no. No. It doesn't matter what you were. You can ride a gold wing and still be okay. <laughs> hey, we are we are called to be unique. God has created every one of us unique. Don't look around at other people, what they have or what they can do or can't do. Say, God has called me to stand up and to impact the lives of the people around me. You know, and it's interesting because I think back to um, how the how it usually works. Coaches and teachers impact kids. They impact students. That's kind of how that works. But I think back to uh, that young man, Tim Tebow, when he was playing for, for Florida, who he was alive and on fire for Jesus Christ, and he impacted his coach and the people around him and all the others because he said, you know, I'm going to serve God, and I'm not going to be ashamed or embarrassed to let people know I'm following Jesus. You know, when he, they had the eye patch things, and he put John 3.16 during one of their championship games. And uh, he said, this is what we're about. We're about following Jesus. And so every one of us need encouragers. We need people to help us make it. Yes. Uh, in uh, Psalms 103, and for us as parents, I wanted to read this verse. Uh, it says, but from everlasting, uh, verse 17, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children and with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. So parents and adults, and we're calling on you to be an army of support. You know, in an army, in a war, there's only a spearhead. There's a small amount of people who are actively engaged in the shooting in the hot part of the war. There's a huge amount of supply people behind the scenes who are making sure they get food and they get bullets and they get water and they get all the stuff that they need so that they can win the, the battle. Our kids are, are involved in a struggle of battle yeah. to A, live for God and B, impact the world around them. And so you have unsaved kids, you've got a lot of hurting, damaged kids at school, and you have some really awesome teachers as well. I thank God for all of our Christian teachers yeah. and we need to pray for them as well. Maybe yeah. pray and fast for them because they have to put up with all the stuff. You know, the whole battle. Because our schools are not a super God-friendly place. Right. We're not a God-friendly place. And, and we need God in our schools. And so we as parents, and so I just want to touch on just about three things for you as parents to help your children and help the kids. Or maybe you don't even have kids, but you can encourage, you can be an encourager. You can be that person that's on the sideline saying, you can do it, you can make it. Pretty excited about that. <laughs> I was looking for a little encouragement there. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Nine you're all of, you're thinking if we encourage him, he'll just go on for <laughs> Baby. An encourager. We all need people to cheer us on, to root for us. Yeah, right. Even even when people who you look at as, as pillars, they still need encouraging words. So the first thing, though, for you as parents to help your kids change the world is for you to really live for God. For you to really live for God. Don't just talk about it or don't just go to church or don't just send them to church. But you show up and live for God every day. That they see you reading your Bible. 
I had a young man in my youth group in uh, Council Bluffs when I was a youth pastor there. And his dad would get up, and before he'd go to work, he'd read his Bible right there at the table, and he'd, leave, he'd just leave it open there on the table. And so his son would come along and then read it, read where his dad was reading. Wow. I don't know. What are you leaving on the table? Wow. First of all, really live for God. Yes. Really live for God. Let your heart and, be, and your passion be God. Your kids will catch your passion. They will, you shape and form them. They see your example. Are you going to be perfect? Probably not. There are only a few of us. <laughs> None of us are perfect, but they see that you are real and that you love God and they see your heart and passion. They see what you get excited about. What you get excited about. Secondly, pay attention to your children. Pay attention. Talk to them. Talk to them. Ask them questions. Ask them. Not just, you because I know how it goes. They come home, and you come home, and you're tired, and you're eating supper, and you're like, so eat supper with them without the TV on. Amen. Say, okay, okay, we're going to sit around the table, and we're going to talk. And you say, hey, how'd school go? And they'll say, I, it was fine. And you'll say, well, what'd you learn? Nothing. <laughs> and that how it goes <laughs> and then you, you begin to ask them questions kids talk to your parents they really do want to help you so you know what's happening in their school because there are some things being taught in our schools that are diametrically opposed to what the word of God says That's right. totally backwards so your kids are hearing these things, and they're saying, this is fact. This is fact. And, and we as parents and as believers are saying, no, the word of God, this is fact. Yes. We have to know what we believe so that we can say, actually, um, and then you begin to explain to them that uh, how God created man, how that we didn't just come from monkeys. <laughs> We didn't come from monkeys. We didn't come from amoebas out to see. We didn't come from all these things. And to know what we really believe so that we can talk about it in a logical sense. Because if you don't know what you believe, how are you going to teach it to your kids? Because your number one responsibility, in fact, in uh, Scripture it says, God hates divorce because he wants to see a godly generation of yes, kids. Amen. He cares about children. Yes. And in fact, Jesus said that if you offend one of these little ones, you would be better off to have a millstone hung around your neck and be thrown in the deepest ocean. God sees these children. He sees these young people. He loves them. So, to talk to them, To pray for them. Yes. Amen. Amen. Your prayers make a difference. Yes. Folks, yes. to pray for our kids. Yes. And you don't have to be like my dad. Storm and Norman. <laughs> <laughs> who, you never had to word, wonder if he was praying for you. <laughs> Did you, Dan? And I'm so thrilled to have my brother and his family here, and my nephew Isaiah, and uh, his family here, and uh, they spent the night in our house and survived. <laughs> thrilled to have them, and uh, it's great having family. <laughs> you ever had to worry and wonder what, because dad prayed loud. <laughs> Not just at church, but I mean at home. Oh God, help Bill. <laughs> no, pray for him. <laughs> you know, you can hear him praying for you. And as parents, you know, our kids kind of expect us, but when, when we, as people of the church, 
look around and say, okay, God, and we ad adopt another young person and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for them this year. I'm going to pray for them this school year. I'm going to pray for them, and I'm going to, I'm going to hold them up before God every chance I remember. And so we are going to, uh, we've got these cards. Because some of you are like, well, I, you know, I don't have the kids. I don't, you know, I don't. We want everybody to be involved. We want everyone to be involved in helping our young people change the world. There are these cards, and you fill those out, put them in the offering, put them up here at the end, however you want to do them. You fill them out, and then Pastor Mallory and Pastor Drew and, and Betty will go through the rosters, and they will send you a magnet, I think it's magnets this year, with a, the name of a young person on it. And you put that on your refrigerator, and every time you go to get something to eat, you say, you know what, God help them. God, please help them. Help them at home. Help them with their school. You know, I, I talked to a young person just this morning. That young person, <laughs> if they would be smart, they would stop coming into my office, because I just do them every week then. And I said, hey, how can we as adults help you with school? And they said, it's stressful enough. Don't make it more stressful when we get home. Mag. Encourage us. Don't, don't nag and make life miserable. Just set up some parameters and love them. And, and realize sometimes they need a break. They need a break. They are, you know, as a parent, it's tough, isn't it? It is. It's hard. It's hard because uh, all of our kids are not the same. What worked on that first one didn't work on that next one, did it? You're like, ah, I don't know. So you're like, God, I don't know how to do this. I need your help. I need your help for us to be in tune with God and on fire for God and sharing what God, sharing with our kids what God's doing in our lives. And loving them. And the last thing is, I've heard so many parents who have come to me and said, you know, when little Johnny was 13, he really wanted to be in church and serve God. But we were too busy. <laughs> We were too busy. I, you know, we had a lot of stuff going on, and so we couldn't really get him in church. And it was just we were too busy. And now little Johnny is seventeen, and mom and dad are saying, "Hey, pastor, could you pray for my son? He's going to be going to jail." And you're like, and he, and he doesn't want anything to do with God. He doesn't want anything to do with anything with church or any of those things. And it breaks my heart. Yes. Parents, we have to strike while the iron is hot. Yes. While they are excited about God and church, we have to pour into them. We have to bring them yes. to places where they will have God encounters. Yes. They're probably not going to have God encounters off in all this other junk. They're going to have God encounters at church and at camp and at those kind of places. That's where they're going to meet God who is going to change their life for eternity. Yes. Amen. People with PhDs and all this education go to hell. Yeah. Education is not going to get you to heaven. Money is not going to get you to, to heaven. So we spend all this time raising our kids up so that they can get degrees, so they can get jobs, so they can make a lot of money, so they can have a lot of money and have a lot of stuff and have a lot of distractions and what about eternal values? Yes. Do we spend as much time training our children of how to learn and live for God and serve God and walk for God as we do all the other stuff? Parents, when kids are hungry for God, 
your job to get them here. Yeah. And sometimes they waffle in there. And you're like, no, you need to be in church. You need to be in church because that's where God's going to touch and change your heart. That's where you're going to learn about how much God loves you. That's when you are going to prepare. You know, and some of you are like, you know, I have my kids in church and they're not really serving God that well right now. But you know what? The scripture says if you will pour it into them when they were little, they will not return void. That those words still come back and, and speak to them as I'm talking to people along the way who aren't aren't doing very well, or they're trying to get turned back around because their lives are so messed up. They're like, oh yeah, I remember in Sunday school that teacher talking about, and some of that stuff just comes back. And it's poured in there. I guess the last thing is that I've never yet met anybody who came to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior who didn't have somebody praying for them. Amen. Amen. Somebody praying for them our heads this morning and before we have the kids come up this morning perhaps you're here and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior you know Pastor Mallory shared about going with the crowd or going after Jesus perhaps you're here this morning and you've been going with the crowd. And you know you're not right with Jesus and you need Jesus to forgive your sins and change your heart and change your life. You see, Jesus died for you. He died on the cross. He took your place and your punishment so your sins could be forgiven so you could have eternity in heaven. And he loves you. And he said, if you will confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Last week, we had several people who made a choice to follow Jesus. Doesn't mean everything's going to be easy or perfect at that point. There's still battles, but now you got Jesus on your side. This morning, if you'd like to ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sins, I just invite you to slip up your hand and say, Pastor, let's pray. Yes. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ. And once you ask him into your heart and life, forgive your sins, and then he's not going to be everything perfect, but he never leaves you or forsakes you. He's still there with you. He's still walking with you because he loves you. Because he, we are his children. He is our provider and our protector because he loves us. Because he loves us. This morning, I want to give a little direction. So, we're going to have all the young people come forward. In fact, go ahead and come on up, guys. Everybody who's going to school, come on up. Stand right across the front here. We 